Hi, I'm Jeff, lead pastor of Northview Community Church in Abbotsford, British Columbia. And this podcast is where I get a chance to interview people about things that I'm interested in and talk about whatever I want to talk about. Welcome back to another pre-conversation conversation. I'm Levi, the producer, and we have again some, well, actually this time just one topic to hear some of Jeff's opinions about. Jeff, are you ready? Yep, ready. Big university in New York, Columbia University. Are you familiar? I am very familiar with Columbia University, yes. They've come out saying that this year they're going to host a whole bunch of separate graduation ceremonies, uh, differentiating between their students for a whole variety of different things, including income level, race. Almost in, uh, Mostly race, though. Yes, mostly. Yeah, so there's one for, for lower income people. Which is course creating, and there's also actually one for they're calling it the I think it's the lavender yes ceremony, which is uh, for LGBTQ plus people. Mm-hmm. So I first I've been wondering, what if you are a lesbian, black poor man? So wait, lesbian black poor woman. Sorry, but this day and age you could go be a man. I don't know. So my question is, do you go to all three or do you go to one? And my second thought, though, is more important, and that is, isn't, like, the KKK celebrating this somewhere? Like, isn't that essentially what segregation... I don't know, man. It's just... It's odd these days. Uh, It's gotten to the point, actually, where our shared humanity is becoming very much a secondary thought, that we're dividing up into our little tribes, and I get a little bit frightened that our tribalism is going to eat away at our at our societies in the worst way. So we're not going to end up viewing our, each other as like so in here in Canada we're not Canadians together. We're we're of our disparate, you know, um, identities. Right? So you're the sum of your identities and and you know, I, it's this intersectionality and the difficulty, you know, like intersectionality is kind of like the the I mean to put it kind of harshly, it's kind of like the suffering Olympics. You're, you know, whoever can talk about the intersection of their identities and you kind of get points for each identity that has historically been, uh, been rubbished or downtrodden or something like that. So if you're part of a community like the LGBTQ plus community that says, well, historically we have been seen as immoral and these sorts of things, that's an oppression. So you get some points for that. And then if you're a woman, you have historically historically been under the thumb of of men, so that's uh, that's another. So you you know you combine all these things up, and it seems like even in the media these days, when somebody gives their identity, it's almost like they're they're like listing off all the ways that they are you know outside the norm, and then they end up getting to speak. Whereas the people like you, Levi, honestly, you are the most privileged person in in that scheme. You are mm-hmm. a white Christian man training to be a pastor. Mm. I, the only thing I would say is that you're not American, so I'm worse. And I'm a little younger. Yeah, and you're a little bit younger. So I, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting situation. But this has become the defining, you know, the defining issue for our day and the way that we understand ourselves. And it's become really, I mean, it's really sad in a lot of ways. I mean, I would like to celebrate our common humanity more than I would like to celebrate uh, necessarily a particular identity, although those identities I think are important. They are important, right? Being if being a black man or, or, or being uh, a, someone from a lower socioeconomic spectrum and stuff, it does define you in some ways. It makes you think about the world in particular ways. But I don't know. I've always thought that the world is better when we get to think outside of ourselves and outside of our, you know what I mean? To, to branch out into other groups and understand where they're coming from. And that tends to help us, you know, be empathetic and these sorts of things. Whereas in the kind of tribalized approach that people are taking, I don't know if empathy is something that's really going to grow there. Yeah, I was struck while I was reading this about just how it it seems like the church in a lot of ways can become more of a a counter culture. As we think about, uh, like, it's very unlikely that I would rub shoulders with people 50 years older than me in any other context, but it's kind of the norm especially on a, a Sunday morning so, gathering. Yeah, and the church, in order to do that, the church is going to have to figure out a way to both celebrate the the differences, mm-hmm. right, between, especially between races, 
uh, they're going to have to celebrate those differences and yet at the same time emphasize you know what what revelation does which is that you know at the end of time we're all going to be wearing white robes and wearing palm you know waving palm branches before the throne of god so there's an equality between us both do you see what i mean mm-hmm. so that it's i don't think we're going to lose our racial characteristics in heaven by any means i think it's going to be a, a beautiful because god created all the different races the way you know to represent his his beauty and and his desires but i i just think that you know, he- heaven is going to be a mul- multicultural, unified, so diverse, unified place. And I think we can start now by living in the kingdom's, you know, outposts and churches now. Yeah, yeah, that'll be a, a tall task for the church, but one I think we will be equipped for in order to do that task. Uh, we're going to get into Jeff's interview with Carrie in the next couple of seconds here. Uh, They talk about all kinds of things from Carrie's life, her upbringing, and some of the really difficult things she faced early on in life and how she's grown uh, from them later in life. So we hope you will really benefit from that conversation. Well... This last weekend, you saw Carrie Clausen on Northview TV. She was highlighted there, and uh, we wanted to have an opportunity to talk to her a little bit more about her story and about the kinds of things that have been happening in her life, both when she was young and even now. So, Carrie, you're here. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. Right. You're on our staff, so you didn't have a choice. <laughs> well, I had a little bit of a choice. <laughs> yeah. A little, little bit. A little bit. Um. I'm really interested. I mean, people uh, probably know a little bit about you just because of the Northview TV stuff, but it's, there's going to be people who are listening who don't watch that. Uh, can you just tell us a little bit about who you are? Where did you grow up? I'll just keep asking you questions about you. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. I'm. So I grew up in a small town in Saskatchewan, Melfort, Saskatchewan. Where? Melfort. Melfort. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It was Is that a- near Dog River? <laughs> See what I did there with the Dog River? Yeah. I'm Canadiana. Um, yeah, it was actually a village. It became a city when I was a kid, so that was a pretty big deal. But um, I grew up there, um, grew up in a Christian home, two brothers, middle kid. Um, I had an amazing childhood. It was a great place to grow up. Uh, grade 12, we moved to Saskatoon, so I did my final year of school there. Um, met Leland in Saskatoon, had both our boys who are 20 and 23 right now um, in Saskatoon. And then shortly after that, we moved out here to BC. Why did you move? Uh, so Leland decided he wanted to do stand-up. Well, yeah, I was going to say, your husband, <laughs> when you met him, was yeah. not was not no. a stand-up comedian. No, he totally tricked me. <laughs> I thought I was getting a nice, sweet prairie boy. And instead, um, about a couple years after we got married, he decided to go stand up full time. So he hadn't even performed What was before. he doing before that? He worked, I forget the order, but he graduated from university with an anthropology degree, <laughs> <laughs> which, which we kind of found to be a little bit useless, but... Really? Yeah. Anthropology. <laughs> Shocking. And then he worked at an insulation company. He worked at uh, a van conversion company. He worked at Purely. <laughs> And so uh, we get the idea. At some point, he was driving his little purillator truck around thinking, I would much rather be standing up in front of people and trying to make them laugh. Yeah, yeah, he was miserable. So we started having those conversations. How did you welcome that news when he came home and he said to you, I want to be a, hey, mom, I'm going to be a stand-up comedian. What did you say? I, when we talked about it, I was like, well, what do you want to do? What do you, what do you dream about? What, what is it? What's that thing that you want to try? He was like, actually, I've been writing stand-up because he was actually tree planting to put himself through university. So while he was out, <laughs> out in the bush, he started writing material. And so I was like, okay, well, let's, let's do it. And I was encouraging him. Crazy me. I had no idea. If a what. tree doesn't laugh in the forest, <laughs> was there a good joke told? <laughs> So he started doing amateur nights just at the local Yuck Yucks clubs. And Sorry, the what? Yuck Yucks. It's a, it was a comedy chain. Is it not around anymore? I think oh, it I is. Oh, I don't know. I'm I not in is. on the Yuck Yuck comedy chain. Yeah. So 
So he started doing stand up, and then he just it progressed, and he wanted to do it full time. So he, yeah, he he's been involved in. Uh, it's basically turned into a Christian ministry mostly. Yeah, actually, surprisingly, he didn't start out that way. He wanted to be a Christian in the secular world, right? Not be a Christian entertainer. So a cl- clean comedian. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but he he told me he wanted to do stand up. I was like, okay, you need a plan B. You, I don't think we can survive on stand-up. So he went back to school, tried to get his education degree, almost done that, and he got offered a VJ job in Vancouver. And that's why we moved, because it was pension benefits company car. I was pretty excited about that. So we took What's a VJ? Someone who comes on in between uh, TV shows. So it was Leave it to Beaver and Ray Romano's show. What was that called? I forget. I can't remember. Everybody loves Raymond. Everybody loves Raymond. Yeah. So those shows were playing on Now TV, and he would come on in between and do all these crazy things. Okay. Yeah. That's fun. great. So he got you, he did he take that job? Yeah, he took it. He okay. did it for two years, and it got us out here, which was hard because we were away from family, friends. Um, but then once we got here, it was we wanted to stay. Yeah. So what's it like having a, a husband who is in? In uh, Comedian, is it like every moment in your house really fun and laughter? <laughs> is yeah. that why you have all the laugh right? lines? And That's exactly. The moment I wake up in the morning till the moment I go to bed. Do you ever just <laughs> stop him and say, tell me a joke? No. <laughs> you know what? I don't think I've ever done that. Okay. No. Tonight, can you go home and say, hey, funny man, <laughs> tell, tell me, me a joke. joke. I will. I'll, tell, I'll do that. Yeah, no, he doesn't even run jokes by me anymore because I just don't laugh and don't think he's funny. But when I see him perform, I really Neither did do. The trees, Carrie. <laughs> I really do enjoy watching him perform, but it's different when he's you're at great home. at it. Your yeah. husband is a great comedian. Well, thank I, you. I adore his comedy. I Every time I get that. a chance to listen to, to him, it's 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 great. He's got such a quick wit, delightful Aww. guy. Like Leland a lot, but. Uh, you guys have had two two children. What are their names? Yeah, Cooper is twenty three. Hunter's twenty. Right, and they're still in the area. Coop's actually in Vancouver. He's a video game designer, so he's living there, working there. Um, he's been doing that for a few years now. And Hunter's going to UFE uh, online at home, <laughs> which he's really not loving at all. But oh, I don't think anybody loves the online uh, school stuff. No. Um, and you work here, and your job is. I'm the executive assistant, kind of slash office manager here. You run Matthew. everything. Between no. you and Val, you basically run it. Val Bosch, Val you run everything. I, yeah, I can't imagine doing this job without Val. <laughs> well, you guys both do a fantastic, a fantastic job here, uh-huh. and uh, we appreciate it very much. Um, so, a little bit of your background, though. You got into modeling when you were young. I did. How yeah. did How did you get into modeling? Uh, my best friend. You're a Christian girl. Christian when girl. you got involved, so is that a <laughs> no? I, it's, I'm that. sure that that's that's great. I'm just don't. Th- are there a lot of Christian girls involved in modeling? Ugh, you know what? I don't know. I don't know. I uh, was it a surprise to you when you got uh, involved in it? Was it something that was it something you aspired to or, or? no? Something I didn't hadn't even occurred to me. Um, my best friend went and took some kind of personal development classes and. I was a bit of a tomboy, and my mom wasn't really interested in that kind of stuff either. So she, I begged her to let me go. So she, she signed me up, and I went. And then a few months later, the agency was calling me, asking me if I'd wanted to enter a modeling competition. Um, but I was kind of just introduced to the idea of it, and I, I loved the idea of traveling and exploring the world and, and doing that through modeling. So the idea of it really captivated me, but... So um, what, what is a modeling competition? Are we talking like one of those online, you know what I mean? The TV yeah, shows where yeah. Tyra Banks says, you're not good enough. So you do runway. So you would have to do kind of a fashion show in order to just to just kind of show that you can do runway. It's surprising how awkwardly some people can walk and do things like that. There's kind of a technique to it. And then you also do some kind of um, video type uh, commercial work. Uh, or a feature, and then photo shoots. And so agents came from Japan. Um, I went and competed, and to everyone's surprise in my family, and probably no one was more surprised than I was, but I got a, a contract to go to Japan. Wow. When I was 15, yeah. 15 years old. Yeah. So you exciting. won the 
you kind of won the contest. Me and two other girls, and one was a good friend of mine, so that was really fun. Just to know that I wasn't going completely alone, too, was right. kind of nice. So how long were you in Japan for? So my parents wouldn't let me go at 15, which I really was hard to take, but yet I wasn't ready. I even knew that. So at 17, as soon as I was out of high school, two weeks out of high school, I went. And my friends that also won the competition were with me on that same trip. Um, so, yeah, sorry, the question was... No, but I... Well, I'm, j I'm very interested to know what it's like to model in Japan. <laughs> like, and yeah. how long... My question was, how long how were long? you there? Right, sorry. Um, so contracts were only two months long. Um, so I did two stints. So I, I left in July, came home, I think it was the end of October. And um, that was when runway season started in Japan, and, and I was too short even for Japan for a runway season. <laughs> so I was kind of done. But it's not a huge country, and if you're working often, which I was, you do kind of, your face is starting to be seen out there mm. a lot. So so are there still uh, ad campaigns and stuff that have your face on them? I would hope not. This is a while ago, but I, <laughs> I am genuinely interested. Because I'm thinking this would have been 17, 18, like you're, that, that's, that's close to the late ago. 80s? Oh yeah, late 80s, 88. Yeah, and so poofy hair. <laughs> back poofy back hair, home bangs. Carry. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love it. You don't have like copies of the photo shoots? I have some. Okay, yeah. we need to see those. That's going to be, we're going to be no, posting those up on our website. <laughs> and also, I think it would be great if you if Leland worked this into his act and then he tried to walk like a model, like the stuff you've taught him. <laughs> this would be good. It's funny you would say that because he was doing a little, I don't know what he was doing last night, but he was m mimicking how guys act at the gym. And then he decided, because he just started doing P90X again, and then he decided it would be really funny if guys, instead of doing that, you know, big beefy look in the mirror between reps, if they did a model walk. And so he started doing the model walk. And did you have to correct him, <laughs> honey? I was like, no. No, you need to out. turn your Come head. Come on. <laughs> right. But yeah, he, so he's done the model walk. He's pretty good. Good. I think he'd have an amazing blue steel. Sorry, that's a <laughs> Zoolander right. reference. I thought that I... He does have an amazing blue steel. <laughs> you're right. He could break the camera with it. <laughs> um, so being involved in, in that world, would you... Like if you found out there was a girl who wanted to be involved in modeling these days, a Christian girl, would you tell him, that's, that's great, go for it? Or would you be like, uh... Yeah, it... The like if you had a daughter, would you be... If I had a daughter, oh man, yeah, that would be hard. Because the industry... There's just so many challenges for Christians in that industry. I can't, it would be, it's not impossible. God can do anything. Um, but I think it'd be very difficult to maintain your morals and values in that industry. And I really um, think that, that God probably has a higher calling for you in your life. Um, but I, I don't know. If someone really wanted to do it, I'd definitely want to sit them down and give them some advice about what they needed to mm. know before they went, for sure. Yeah. Um, Carrie, one of the things that in the last number of years so I, that you've come out with uh, that I didn't know about you that actually has piqued my interest mostly for why it is that uh, I wanted to talk to you. There are a thousand other reasons to talk to you. You're delightful, but... I am most interested in the fact that uh, you had an abortion when you were younger. I did, yeah. And that is something that you have only recently started writing about or talking about a little bit more. Yeah. So I would love to chat with you a little bit about that. For sure, yeah. What led you, uh, like what, what was the circumstance that led you into into this? Like what's hmm. the story behind it? Uh, was it a, I'm assuming it was a shock to you. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, you know what, that, that's such a loaded question and it's one that I've kind of wrestled over for years how did I get to that point where I would do something like that and I, I do have some things I'd love to share with you but I, I was just even thinking about it today and I was like you know the short answer might just be I was really stupid <laughs> and really just kind of stubborn, but um, but I can give you a better than that. Um, so yeah, there were a few things like I, as I said before, I grew up in a in a great Christian home, and I had a great family. My parents didn't just believe in Christ; they lived it out in their day to day life, and and I was well connected with my church family. I had a pastor who came and watched me figure skate at six a.m. once. Like I was known and loved by my church family. Um, so it, 
I think it would kind of throw some people and maybe parents of kids that have kind of gone sideways. It's like, but we did everything right. <laughs> How did this happen? Um, but I think there were some things that um, that brought me there. And and I think well, one of the main ones was when I was 16, I lost my virginity. And, and once I kind of crossed that line in my life, it felt like there was no turning back, hmm. that that I couldn't get back what I had lost. So so there was no point to even pretend it didn't happen or to try to live differently. It was just something that was like, okay, it's something I've done and now I have to live with it and I guess that's who I am. Hmm. And so that was a, a big one that started me on that path. And then around the same time, my parents started struggling in their marriage, which isn't a big deal. I mean, I know we all kind of go through our ups and downs in marriages and I know that now too after being married for so long. But but it really shook me up at that particular time in my life that it just, my parents were so solid and the fact that they would do anything wrong or it just, yeah, it just kind of shook me up. So there was that. And then I also, I didn't really feel like I got the answers that satisfied me when I asked kind of some tough questions. And What kind of questions? Well, just the church back then I think was a little more quiet about topics like sex before marriage or even there, there had clear rules about drinking and smoking and, and it was a little more legalistic mm. back then in the 70s and 80s. Um, and I just was like, I don't, I don't really see why that's so bad. You know what I mean? Right. It was like I wanted to have fun and it just seemed like there was a whole lot of rules that were trying to prevent me from mm. doing that. And so I, I didn't really feel satisfied with those answers. Right. They didn't try to sell you on a positive view of sexuality yeah, and yeah. that the Christian uh, sexual ethic is part of a greater story and that kind of thing. It's more like, right. go, here are the things that you don't do. Yeah. Well, why don't I do them? Yeah. Just don't. Just don't. You, do, you don't want to. It's, God doesn't want you to do that. And I was like, yeah, but... <laughs> <laughs> but, but I also my relationship with Christ, I didn't understand what a personal relationship look like. And I, and it wasn't that I didn't want it. I just didn't get it. I was like, I don't, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. But what is a personal relationship? I tried reading my Bible. I tried praying and it just didn't seem to be going anywhere. And I, and I, and to be honest, I really just didn't try very hard either. I, it was like, eh, whatever. I just want to have fun. Let's just go with the flow. Um, so there was a lot of things that kind of led up to it, but I think when I left for Japan, I really kind of had this feeling like I was an open book. I just wanted to see what the world was like. I didn't really have any firm convictions myself, and I just wanted to experience life. And <laughs> I think when you kind of head out that way, it's not a great way to, I don't know, knowing, knowing what I know now, um, you can kind of clearly see how that's never really going to end well. But Right. Well, I mean, there are positive ways of wanting to go out and see the world right. and to experience different cultures and those sorts of things. But uh, there is the sowing your royal oats approach, which is like, well, I want to go out and have fun. I've been kind of trapped for all these years. And, mm-hmm. you know, everything I see looks awesome on, you know, TV or whatever. Right. It is. kind of sells it to you. And so you end up going out and, and doing that. So how old were you when you when you got pregnant? So I was 19. Okay. So when I got home from Japan, I started dating a guy quite seriously. He wasn't a Christian. And um, I was really used to going out every night and just going to the bars and drinking. And so that was very much a part of my life, just hanging out with friends every night. And and that was our lifestyle. It, almost everything we did kind of centered around alcohol, whether that was mm-hmm. hockey games or, or whatever we did. Baseball, it didn't matter. It was, yeah. So... Um, so yeah, I we had dated for a few years, and um, he he wasn't. I was also kind of naive in a weird way. It was a weird combination of being naive but also worldly. I don't know how to explain that, but it's like a you're naive about good and evil almost. You you kind of think, well, this guy's not bad. He's got a lot of redeeming qualities. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, sure. He gets into bar fights and he does a few things that aren't great, but he's a good guy. And so I always kind of saw the positive in things, and, and it was really kind of just naive and, and, hmm. and not really wise. Um, so we did it for a few years. I found myself pregnant. and At 19? At 19. Right. And yep. so what, like what went through your mind when you first found that out? Panic. Sheer panic. Um, Were you alone when you found out? 
Yes. Well, I was at I was at the hospital. Or sorry, at my doctor's, I believe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So my doctor told me. So I told my boyfriend and he kind of responded, I think, in pretty a pretty typical way, <laughs> which is, Oh, well, you can do what you want, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be a father to this kid kind of attitude, wow. right? Yep. And and just very much leaving it totally um, in my court. And so uh, my roommates had actually talked when I was in Japan quite openly about abortion. And, and a lot of them, shockingly, kind of had abortions, some of them multiple. And they talked about it in such a way, like they even just said that it wasn't a big deal. They didn't have regrets. And so that had really been planted in my head before I even got to this point. And so... I also was, during that time, not, I didn't have any godly counsel in my life. None of my friends were Christians. Um, I was still going to church, but I was not listening at all. I wasn't listening to my parents. Um, my doctor wasn't a Christian. So it was very easy for me to kind of tune out or not even seek godly counsel. And, and I, I don't even know, I, pro I might have avoided it even if, if I had it. I, I didn't want to hear what... I was supposed to be doing, and so that so I made that choice. So, did it take very long for you to make a choice to abort the child? Was I mean, was there a period of time where you thought, you know, what I, I can keep it? So that kind of Christian upbringing is coming back in your mind, and you're thinking, actually, yeah, uh, abortion seems like a a pretty big deal, right? Um, and and I'm also wondering, like, when you were thinking about it, did you did you think, well, it's a child, or did you? not think that was were you more like well actually it's it's not really a person yet so you know i hate keep going back to my time in japan but it had such an influence on my life and and i think while i was there it really enforced for me just the modeling industry alone kind of enforces that separation from mind and body and that your body is just a tool to be used and and your your soul and mind are separate and I mean, no one is paying you to think or feel <laughs> when you're modeling. You're just being paid to look a certain way and for the clothes to hang on you on a, in a certain way. So you need to be a certain weight and you need to look a certain way. Um, so, but that really did, I, tr I had basically just had spent two years training myself to separate mind and body. And so when it came to making the decision with the abortion, it was surprisingly easy to be able to say no. I'm, I'm not. I'm going to shove my feelings aside, and I'm going to do this because it's not convenient. And that was the reason ultimately for you. And yep. like it, it just was. I mean, I've got this boyfriend. He's not going to be involved at all. Yeah. Okay, I'm 19 years old. And my future is totally in yep. your mind at that point at stake. And my Christian faith was so superficial at that point. All it did was make me feel shame and guilt. Not. Right. It didn't encourage me to do the right thing. Right, and so you, you went you went through with it. Uh, were you? I mean, immediately, like, did did it just sort of go away then, right right afterwards, or was it? Um, were there any feelings of regret, or did you f feel nothing for a long time? The, you feel actually, differently now, oh, which absolutely. is, I mean, I've talked yeah. to you before, and you feel yeah, very differently now. Absolutely. So I'm kind of wondering what when yeah. when did that happen? You know, and, and so I was just saying how I was able to shove it down, but to be honest, when it actually came to the, the day and the walking down the hallway following the nurse to do it, I was filled with panic and dread, and it was terrible. Um, and I just remember even thinking at that time, well, maybe God will send someone to stop me. So if I just turn around, then... And there's someone there, anyone. It didn't matter if it was the janitor. <laughs> if there was somebody there, I would stop. And there was no one there. And so I, I just went through with it. And so it was traumatic, the experience itself, um, and, and kind of horrifying. But but I was able to shove it down. And over Did the months and years... Did you know a whole lot about year, the experience itself before you got in there? So in high school, back in the 80s, they actually did a, a kind of educational health educational kind of thing where they show you pictures of an unborn fetus and they tried to educate teens about what it is mm -hmm. and so I had those images in my head and I just oh yeah it made it really hard yeah, that. <laughs> but I was able to over the months and years after that just 
push it down and not think about it. So at what point did it stop being pushed down? So I, I got to a really low point about a year after with my boyfriend and we finally broke up and I finally realized I'm not having fun. <laughs> All those things I'm seeking after are really not bringing me the joy that I'd hoped they would. And, and so I got to such a low point that I was like, you know what, I just I need to stop making decisions for my own life. I'm clearly not doing a very good job. And so I finally got to the point where I saw God's will for my life and I submitted everything uh, to him. And that um, started me on a very slow journey, um, my faith journey. And, um, and then that's when I met Leland and he was so black and white with everything. Um, and for me, everything was still very gray for a long time. It's kind of surprising to me, even still how our Christian walks are just so painfully slow. Yeah. Um, but so we were attending church and I was seeking God's will um, with every decision and, and trying to commit my life to him and to glorify him. But we decided to have kids about a year after we got married. And so soon after I got pregnant, um, um, but then I miscarried. And so before I miscarried, when you would say that to, to me, I'd be like, oh, you miscarried. That's too bad. Um, that must be hard. But when you, I think when you've actually gone through that experience, and, and I miscarried at 17 weeks. Mm. And so it, it was a little bit further along than a lot of miscarriages are. I aborted at 14 weeks. Wow. And so there was only a few weeks difference between the two. And there was kind of the added shock of miscarrying twins. So I had to go through the labor and the delivery. You had the pain and the blood and, and, and just kind of all the normal things that come with delivering a baby. And, and it was that moment that I had to kind of fully face what I had done. I was able to, I asked for forgiveness, obviously, yeah. for that in the past, but, but actually the having it. The gravity of it, though. Yeah, the gravity of it. Later. Absolutely. And, and I just couldn't kind of hide it or, or stop. And I really tried not to think about it, even after I committed my life back to Christ. And, but I just couldn't ignore it anymore. And, and it was bizarre to me to just like just the ridiculousness of, of what the difference between 14 weeks and 17 weeks and, and how there was no difference. The only difference was my attitude towards the pregnancy and, and just having to kind of deal with, with um, exactly what I had done. And, and yeah, so th that really brought me to the point where um, it was actually amazing because I, I felt in those moments just so much grief um, but, and I felt like I deserved to feel that way, but it was amazing to me that God, I felt God's love then more than I ever had before, which was incredible. Yeah. And I didn't realize until then how much I had been fully forgiven. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Um, so you haven't, you didn't, you haven't talked about it that much though. <laughs> I, I mean, haven't. there's a difference between feeling the the relief of, of forgiveness or the realization that God has forgiven you. Yeah. Uh, and and then the, the actually sharing this story. And it's only been recently that you've felt a little bit more open to do that. Yeah. So what changed? Like, why why be open about it? Well, I, I always knew God didn't want me to waste my experience. And I mean by that is that if I knew if I shared it, it would probably help someone. So, but I didn't know what that looked like for me. As you know, Jeff, I hate speaking publicly. Yeah. <laughs> and so I really, I think that was one of the things I even said to him, I'll do anything, but not speak. Right. <laughs> but so I, I volunteered at a, at a home for young women that were pregnant or cutting or going through different things. And I did that for a long time. And, and I kind of really struggled with how to speak out. Um, and, and what God wanted me to do with it. And I actually sat on that for 10 years and I kind of, maybe even more, but I, I, I kind of had a bit of an epiphany at one point and I was like, am I doing the same thing that I did all those years ago where I was putting myself on a path and then saying, okay, God, you correct us. Yeah. <laughs> right. And, and I was like, I think I know what I should be doing. I don't need God to like 
put it in my lap. <laughs> I, so then I decided, okay, I will share it. Um, but then I had to get over that hurdle of first telling my sons and telling my in-laws, which was so hard. Um, they were amazing, though. They yeah. were amazing. Um, but I had to tell a lot of people first, and, and it was people I loved and cared about. Right. And so I was worried about their responses. Why were you worried? Uh, I mean, is it because you're from a Christian background and, like, abortion is, I mean, we we believe the baby is a baby, yeah. right? Yeah. And that life begins at conception and that yes. we have some biblical material that actually seems to support that. You know, I knit you together in your mother's womb and that kind of stuff. Or And so, as a result, is it because of this, the gravity of it? Or was it you're a little bit worried that the church church people are? <laughs> do you know what I mean? The picture of yeah, church people is yeah. like, oh my gosh, if I tell them that this that I did this, that the reality of my background, they're gonna be they're like, gonna think less of me, right? Yeah, ultimately less yeah. of you. And I think, yeah, that must have been how I was feeling. I don't know why I felt that way though, because honestly, I think people would be shocked at how forgiving <laughs> the church is. I've never. Um, even when people didn't know that I had had an abortion and I have had conversations with my church friends about abortion, they've expressed kind of confusion and, and not understanding how someone can get to that point. But I, I think that's for perfectly valid. I, and I don't think people are as harsh as they, as we kind of perceive them to be. Yeah, it's interesting. Like your story is, I mean, I, I know others who've been involved in, you know, th their backgrounds have all sorts of challenges or things that they've done that they they deeply regret and have sought yeah. God's forgiveness and certainly re, certainly gotten it but their attitude uh, or their hesitation to share it with others is this this conception that the church is going to cast you out mm -hmm. right they're gonna cancel you right. because you didn't do this stuff and yet um, I have found personally as somebody who struggles with mental health that the more open you are about stuff like like this, the more people actually end up coming up to you and saying, do you know, I don't have it all together either. And these are, this is my story. And it's almost like everybody mm -hmm. has got something behind the scenes. Yes. Some are more severe than others, of course. Yep. Um, but somebody has got something behind the scenes that they look back on and think that, you know what, the, here's, you know, evident, evidence piece number one, that I am a <laughs> sinner. Do you know? Right. Yeah. Um, but I think that sometimes there's this attitude in the church that, uh, or that we maybe perceive it to be that, that, you know, church people have to have it all together. And yet that's part of the reason I wanted to ask you on is that we don't, I mean, you do have it all together, Carrie. I no, do like, seriously, when we oh meet you goodness. and stuff, you're no, uh, proficient at all the things you do. <laughs> you're lovely and kind and delightful. And yet there's this, this past that you had that God has done a work in mm -hmm. as well. So it's, yeah, it, I'm hoping that people are encouraged um, to know that, first of all, that God forgives greatly. Right. And that life uh, beyond forgiveness is can, can be a flower garden in the midst of a wasteland. Right. And that's been such a surprise to me how you almost can't even regret my mistakes because I feel, I because of that, I feel so much hope and so much joy. Right. And you're in the position that you are today. Because of it. Um, okay, w I do have one last serious question. Okay. And then you're going to ask me a question to finish this. Okay. Give advice to somebody who is facing this kind of decision. Hmm. A young woman, young man, who, who have made, you know, whatever errors that they've made, uh, maybe got thrust into it, maybe feel justified, whatever. Yeah. What, give, can you give advice to somebody either who has had an abortion or somebody who's considering it? For somebody who's considering it, I would just want to say that God wants you to live a life full of joy and free from regret and shame. And until we're willing to submit ourselves fully to him and his will for our lives, um, we will never be truly free. And so he's calling you to himself. Don't ignore it. Mm -hmm. um, for that person that maybe has already made that um, mistake and, and is trying to cope with the consequences of that. It's just, it's such good news to know that God is infinitely capable of taking on our sin and that the price has already been paid for us. And yeah. that is such an amazing thing. It is. Living example of the gospel at work, Carrie. 
Right, so you have to ask me a question now, Carrie. Yeah. I've, at, with all the guests that I have, I ask them to ask me a question because I ask all sorts of really difficult questions, and now you get the chance. <laughs> Way you go. Okay, so not many people have a chance to speak from a podium like you do or even be on a guest as a guest on a podcast like I am. So what is the call to action for Christians on issues like abortion? Yeah, so... My answer to that question, I think, is uh, something. And, and you have to understand what I, I mean. I, I don't want to bind the conscience of somebody and say the only way that a Christian can respond to this is by you know, joining the march or, or standing outside of an abortion clinic and protesting or uh, voting a particular way. I, I don't actually think that I want to bind you that way. But I do want to bind you with the idea that... Uh, Abortion is probably the greatest social ill of mm-hmm. our day. I'm happy if you want to debate that, uh, that oh, there's other social ills. Yes. Racism. Yep. There's also, you know what I mean? There's all sorts of social ills. But we have to, as Christians, recognize that free access ultimately, and the fact that, that women are aborting their children and that, and that our culture champions that has got to be mm, one of the right. most outrageous I agree. Uh, social issues of our day. So I do think that We are obligated to care about it in the same way I think that people in, I mean, everybody uses the World War II imagery, but like people in Germany were obligated to care about the Jewish people who were getting killed. I think that Christian people are obligated to care about abortion. Mm -hmm. Uh, You might be somebody who speaks out about it. That's great. You might be somebody who prays deeply about it and is involved in some other way. My mom was, uh, she worked as a nurse in a, um, in a, what they call a pregnancy care clinic. Um, now here in Canada, it's a little bit different because of public health care, but there are groups, Signal Hill and others that actually are involved in, in uh, trying to care for women who either have had an abortion or are considering it and those sorts of things. I think that if you're a doctor, uh, and you're Christian, I, I really press this on you to think very deeply about whether or not that, that is a point at which you can, you know, you know, like I think it, in all of our work, we have situations where we're going to have to part ways hmm. with uh, the secular culture and what it tells us is true and good. Yeah. And I think that, so for modeling, I think sometimes, you know, this division between your body and your mind is something you want to, you want to, push away from. They might ask, they might ask you when you're modeling as a Christian to do things and you say, I'm not doing that. Yep. Similarly, when it comes to our professions as doctors or others involved in the medical community, I think that I would encourage them because they're the ones actually on the front lines of this and have an opportunity to actually make probably the most significant difference. Unfortunately, it's probably the most costly one for them too. Mm. So yeah, there's lots of ways for people to get involved in it. But I, I pray that the that we will not turn our our faces away from from the issue and the difficulty both of the fact that children are being killed and the fact that it is a burden on on the lives of women who have who have done it they need forgiveness mm-hmm. uh, those who are considering it need hope and the babies uh, need saving but God is in control of these things, and so ultimately we give him thanks for the way he's working it out. I am so thankful that you have been here. I usually do a lightning round with people, but do I you? don't want to do a lightning round with you. I'm You're really mad at stuff like that anyway. <laughs> so good. God bless you for being here, Carrie. Uh, thank you You're for great. having me. You're great. If you see Carrie around, uh, don't talk to her. She will not want you to know. <laughs> she loves talking to people, but it's also, uh, yeah, it's hard sometimes putting your story out there because lots and lots of people get really, really interested. Hopefully you'll be able to pray for her though in the days ahead. Pray for Leland in the days ahead. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Conversations with Jeff. Make sure you subscribe to catch up on all upcoming episodes. So until next time, love God, do what you want, and don't be stupid.